Nick, did you have a great weekend? What's up? Still having a good weekend. Yeah. What are you talking about? I uh, So we're doing a, something a little different for our podcast than we normally do, but it was, Nick called me up on a Friday and says, Angelette, did you watch the debate? And I'm like, who did it? So tell us what was on your mind when you called me up, you know, last Friday. People want the president to solve all their problems for them. That's basically what my takeaway was. But the problem is people expect the president to do all these things, but the president can't. 500 people even in Washington, D.C. can't solve all the problems of 320 or 30 million people across a continent that they've never met and don't know anything about. It's just impossible. It's logistics. So that's why people are so frustrated and getting angry about politics today. During the presidential debates, the questions that were asked, which were supposed to be representative of what the people wanted to hear, right, created by the Presidential Debates Commission, they were questions increasingly that had nothing to do at all with the executive branch. Or the role, government. the role of the executive branch, right? Exactly, as outlined in the constitution. Uh, the, they're questions not for a president at all, but for a king, for, for a dictator. And this should never be a giant blind spot in the American point of view, the American way of thinking about solving, solving problems. We so we have to stop being a victim and expecting Washington to do everything. But we why, have to take personal responsibility. Yeah. yeah. But I was gonna ask you, why do you think people think that the president should be solving the problems for them? Is it, is it the way we're thinking or is it because we watch the news and, or these debates and those are the kind of questions that they're asking of, of a potential president? You know, it's a really interesting question. Like, is it that the debates commission goes and polls people about what they want to hear and they, they pick the questions and topics based off that? Or are people's opinions about what the president should be talking about based off of what they pick in the debate to talk about? I don't really have a clue. But the fact is, all of the topics, right, were talk they talked about, um, here's what they talked about. There was, there was, talk about your presidential records, fine. Um, talk about the Supreme Court, the president appoints, uh, the court has, so fine. They talk uh, about- National about security it. and leadership. Yeah. Fine. But then it's like, okay, let's talk about the economy and the market and business. That has nothing to do with the executive branch is, as outlined in the constitution. Let's talk about race in right. America. That has nothing to do with with the executive branch. Let's talk about the integrity of the election. I mean, yeah, they're about to have an election. It's relative at that point, but is that the president's role? Um, let's talk about fighting COVID and people's health has nothing to do with it. Climate change, case in point. So all these things that they're, they're asking are questions for someone who didn't have a, a check and a balance. They're questions for a king who has unitary power across all branches of government or can act irrespective to them. And this is what we see. If you look historically, the executive branch has attempted to make huge grasps at power over the separation of powers uh, from the start of the American Civil War to the executive orders that, that they see to circumvent Congress, the emergency powers, the security classifications um, national security being used as an excuse to do everything. That word is just, just completely thrown around today as if it has everything is a matter of safety. And uh, there's this theory called the unitary executive theory. And this is a theory that the executive branch exists completely independent. It has to be because when it's, it exists to, for an emergency. And so, yeah, he can veto. Yeah, he has some appoint, appointees. And yeah, he can, you know, petition his, his cabinet and stuff. But he's chief of the military and Congress doesn't get to intervene because if there is a screen, if there's a filter, then you can't act in a timely manner to address really pressing uh, risks. It's like security threats, right? National security threats. So there's this, this idea, but there's, there's different camps, right? People disagree about what exactly constitutes the executive power. And some people think that the uh, uh, president should come with grand plans. And if you look at the last debate, 
every question started with what's your plan? What's and, your it, plan? Yeah. and it was not just a plan about national defense. It's what's your plan for healthcare? What's your plan for the economy? What are your, what's your plan for how businesses and restaurants should do this safely? It had nothing to do with the, the, the powers of the president as outlined in the constitution. And this means only one thing. It means that the questions are meant for a king. You can only have a grand plan for all these things that, that overlap all the other branches of government if you have total power or if people want someone who has total power. That was the main takeaway from, from the debates. And it's a pretty scary thought. Yeah, I mean, the president does have powers, like you said, veto powers. Um, they can make executive orders, but yeah, when I'm now, now that you got me thinking in these these type of questions, it's like, do people want the president just to sign off on a bunch of executive orders without check and balances? I, that that is that's a very interesting point. I love this king and this unitary. What did you call it? Unitary, unitary executive theory. Theory. What 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 kind of people are like aligned with that type of theory? Do you know? Or where'd you find well, this? I would say that this is I. So I was looking into it because I was I I did I do these experiments, right? I will ask Google questions <laughs> that I want to hear from the American public, and I'll look how many millions of other people have been talking about this, and I see what other people are saying and journalists have written about. So I typed in, "Does America want a king?" and I found books like "The American Dictator" and uh, all these different. Um, articles being being written about specifically the theory that I'm talking about, unitary executive theory, and the different interpretations of what should be the president's role. And there's there's a lot of commentary on it, but there's also not a lot of of attention on it. There's there are a lot of talking heads. There are a lot of policy experts who are talking about the different interpretations of this, but the general public was not really engaged in this. This is a glaring blind spot. Okay, in our, our awareness of the way that we're going about this election. And it's gonna result in a king if we don't look out. It's so, gonna, there's gonna be a king who's gonna come up and fill the void, the supply so and demand. If, if you were the moderator of these debates, um, what kind of questions would you be asking? That's a good question. Um, well, the president deals with national security and foreign affairs and all of our foreign entanglements that the military industrial complex has created more of a permanent situation around. I think that's a really good question to ask about. Um, I think that, you know, some of the, I would be asking maybe even about these topics, but about whether or not this is actually the proper role of government or the proper role of the presidency, because there's a lot of things that we're engaging in right now under executive order about climate change, under executive order about COVID, under executive order about race and police relations and things that I don't think fall within the president's role at all. And I don't think people are even asking the question, is this the proper role of the executive branch? So all these grand plans that they're introducing, I would definitely start the question about those grand plans with, should the president be introducing legislative plans at all? Yeah, yeah. What about I you? What what about me? What kind of questions? Yeah, what what's one of your top questions? Oh, I that's a good that, that that's a good <laughs> that that is a good question. Um, I guess I've been brainwashed to think that we should be thinking about what the president should do. I I don't know. I I mm. would you know things. I'm I'm more of a policy girl, right? I, I look at policy and not so much about what the president should be doing in regards to, I don't know, social justice issues. I mean, a lot of that is beyond a president's control, right? Those are, a lot of that is, is, is local issues. And I'm sorry, that was my phone and my email is alerting me that I have a call to make. <laughs> um, Let me ask you this. So what do you think would happen if people got their wish and we actually had a uh, president who was like a king. Well, I, I, I think if we if we move closer to a a top down society or closer to socialism, we could get that. And if we keep 
asking for a president to, you know, wave that magic wand and make these, these orders or, or, or fulfill the ask that we have, we could fall into, to what we we've seen in like Cuba or Venezuela. Um, that's my thought. So what would you, okay, let's put it this way. Cause we're, this is be the solution podcast. We're obviously talking about be the solution to this cry for an American King situation. What do you think people should be thinking about or doing differently if they were going to be the solution to all the things that they're, they're crying out to a president to come and, and save them about, right? I, so we got race issues, economic issues, health issues. What were the other topics? Yeah, um, I, I think we- Climate uh, change. I think we need to stop playing victim. And we, st- we need to stop being a victim and expecting Washington, Washington to do everything because we, we have the, the power within ourselves um, to take personal responsibility of our own lives and create bottom-up solutions. I mean, that's what this podcast is about and what we've been introducing previous guests about, um, you know, taking responsibility from, from just a small community, local level, state level, and, you know, um, taking responsibility and action all the way you know, to the national level. We have that power. Um, we shouldn't so, be relying on the government for everything. So let's talk about race, right? If, yeah. if you want to be the, be the solution around the problem of, of race, people believe there's racism going on, there's racial disparity, there's racial violence, and everyone is crying out for a government solution. We need to, to modify the police. We need the government to step in and have harsher punishments and, and all this stuff. And there may be a place for some, some reform here for sure. But what can individuals do about this issue? Because no one is talking about what individuals can do besides go out and protest or, or loot or something like that. That's all people can do. And there's even worse cries out for, for violence around this. That's the solutions that people yeah. have got at the individual level. Those are terrible solutions. It's not the solution. Are there people actually doing something yeah. Start the bottom up and being the solution that we can talk about. Yeah. And we need to invite them to our podcast. <laughs> we do. So there's a gentleman. He has a great Ted talk called why I talk to the KKK. His name's Daryl Davis. And he's an African-American uh, musician who began this experiment to meet up with the leader of the Ku Klux Klan um, without letting him know that he was a black man. And he met up with him. And he talks about his experience, his encounter with this person who thinks he's less than human and runs a big group of, uh, you know, the Ku Klux Klan. And he talks about how this changed the relationship, how they kept meeting up, how they actually grew to become friends, how this man left the Klan, and how since then he's had over 600 people turn over their robes. To him, Daryl Davis, yeah. as a result of, of his actions. And he's taken no political actions. He's not making any kind of top-down threats that if you guys don't stop doing what I uh, don't agree with, then I'm going to have the government come in. And I'm not saying there's not a, a role for that if there's some actual violence. But he's doing this completely as a result of his individual action, he is being the change. He, is, yeah. he said, I am the answer and he's proving it. And this is one of how many different possible examples and stories that, that we haven't even uncovered yet. See, and you just shared that story with me and I've never heard of that story. And what we need to do as individuals is to elevate these type of stories um, and elevate them, not, not just on social media, but get, get the, the, the mainstream media to cover these stories. There was, um, that reminded me of, um, it was in Arthur Brooks's book, I forgot the name of the book, but he talked about a gentleman who was the leader of the Black Lives Matters uh, group out of New York, who happened to be in front of a uh, Trump rally in DC, and he was invited to speak and everyone, he was like, this is not my audience, but he got to engage with that audience and they received him with, you know, with applause and, 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 and spoke to him, um, with such admiration afterwards. And uh, 
you know, those are the stories that need to be elevated. And I hope we can elevate it through our podcast and through other means. Um, and, and that's that will hopefully inspire other people to create bottom up solutions and realize the government is not always the answer for everything. I remember seeing this video. So this was a Black Lives Matter. It was the president of Black Lives Matter at the time. Yeah, from New York, from the New York chapter. New York chapter, right. Okay. And yeah. he went to a MAGA rally. Is that right? Or he- A Trump he rally? There. He, he didn't go there. I think, yes. I think he went- He went there, there to protest that. Protest it. Yes, correct. He was protesting it. And he went there expecting a fight or at least an argumentative, yeah. uh, you know, combative situation. And they invited him on stage yeah. and said- to paraphrase, you may not believe in what this guy has to say. You may not agree with what this guy has to say, but we will fight to protect his right to say it. So we're going to give this man two minutes to share his message. And they did on stage at this MAGA or Trump rally. And he shared his message and people cheered. And afterward, people went up and took pictures with him and started a lot of alliances. I think they even formed some kind of coalition. Yeah. We, and we need more of that. We need more of that. And we need to, ele like I said, elevate those type of stories. The, the demonizing that's happening today of, of the other is something that in order to really get at this, we have to be able to confront our boogeyman. A boogeyman. I love yes. it. And yeah. I've, I said this as the challenge in the last episode, and I'm going to say it again. This is the most important thing that we can do. So I want to tell you a quick story, if that's okay, about a time that somebody confronted me and I was their boogeyman. Okay. And then I'll tell you about a time he, that I confronted my boogeyman. Okay. So I was in Sweden and I uh, uh, was going to the language center. I just moved there. I needed to learn the language so that my, my wife and her family didn't have to just speak English to me the whole time. I want to speak Swedish to them. So I'm on there. I'm on crutches. It's extremely, you know, vulnerable situation. And um, somebody hears me sp speaking English in North American accent. And uh, this guy shouts out across, across the room. Hey, you are from America, no? And he comes walking over with his, he's a big guy too. And he came over with his five big buddies. And he said, what do you think about us Muslims? What do you think about Obama? Isn't it true that on American TV, all they show is us Muslims as terrorists, blowing things up and doing bad things. Isn't it true that, and I start to get into an argument with him. I'm like, oh yeah, well, isn't it true that on Iraqi TV, all they show is US soldiers blowing things up and doing bad things. And, and, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, stop. All right, we're gonna do this again. We're gonna walk away and come back together. And this time, uh, I want you to talk to me like I'm your brother, okay? And let's just see what happens. Cause you don't know it yet, but we are brothers. And so he looked at me and then he kind of looked back at his, his five big buddies. And he looked back at me and he said, but that is how I want to talk to everyone, my friend. And I've tried to have conversations with people and they just keep arguing. And he invited me back to his house and cooked me dinner, his, the food that he traditionally ate from Iraq. We sat on the floor, ate with our hands. We shared about our cultures. And do you know what I found out? I found out that this man had lost his family in the Iraqi war. They were civilian casualties and he fled as a asylum a refugee to, to uh, uh, Sweden. And I was the first American he had ever met. I got to be the first impression on this guy. And so when he, when he looked at me, when he first saw me or heard me speaking English, I was his boogeyman. He looked at me and he saw America as he had known from the media, as he had known from Hollywood or, or whatever. And this guy had the cojones to confront me face to face and talk to me about these issues, right? And he never got violent, never got confrontational. He was just a very direct and assertive person. And maybe that's his culture, right? That kind of courage does something. And, and all the fog that's between us it can completely just dissolve because the, the light of that truth that came through shines twice as bright when it comes 
from out behind clouds, like, like the labels that we had had about each other. It was a very powerful encounter. And after that, I actually went and tried to figure out, well, who the heck is my boogeyman that I need to confront? And it was actually law enforcement. Uh -oh. So you get ready for this. <laughs> so I said, okay, this is the, the next time that I see someone working in law enforcement, I'm going to go up and I'm going to have a conversation with them. And I'm going to talk to law enforcement until I'm no longer standing face to face with a cop, but with a human being, right? Boom. So it's about midnight. I walk into a gas station. I'm tired. I'm about to go home. And I see two police officers leaning up against a wall next to the coffee machine, working the night shift. And I say, uh, something. What's up, fellas? What are y'all doing out so late? You know? And they say, well, what are you doing out so late? And I say, oh, fair enough. This is going to go great. So I go up to talk to him, right? And I go, no, no, really. You know, I mean, um, I don't get to talk to a lot of law enforcement. What's it like in your line of work? What do you, is it exciting at night or is it pretty dull and you just have to stay awake or, you know, what's it like? I'm sure my line of work is the farthest from your line of work. So I've said this and I, in the hindsight, I probably sounded like a criminal, but anyway. And he said, why don't you take three steps back? Can you take your hands out of your pockets? Is that your car outside? Is it registering your name? You got an ID on you. Let me check you out. And he starts going through all this cop stuff. And I'm like, great. I go, you, you look nervous. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm real nervous. I said, this is weird, huh? He said, yeah. I said, people don't come up to you and talk to you, do they? And he said, no, not like this. Usually people just wave and they say hello and they're polite, but no, this is pretty weird. So I'm going to need to take you outside and, and check you out. You know, so I'm being detained for, for talking to a police officer and go outside. There's two officers. One's younger. One's, one's an older, more senior officer who was a little bit more chill. And uh, they're running my plates, trying to figure out, you know, if I'm a criminal or not. And when he comes back, I say, I got to say, do you know why I came up to talk to you? And he, they said, no, no, we really have no idea. Why? And I said, because every time I see a cop with a big badge and flashing red and blue lights and hear a siren, I have anxiety in my stomach. And I don't see a person, I see a cop. And every time that I hear you talk to me and say, why don't you take three steps back? You take your hands out of your pockets. Let me see some ID. Is that your car? I know that you're not seeing a person either. You're seeing something more like a suspect or a potential troublemaker or uh, a criminal or something. And we're drawing smaller and smaller circles around ourselves until eventually there's nobody left that we can really even identify with in a brotherly way. And there's a lot of talk about a war going on. And one side says it's a war on the American people by the over-militarization of the police. And other side says, no, this is a war on cops by cop-hating Americans. And I say, I don't think that's it. I do think there's a war going on, but I think it's, it's not a war between us and them. It's a war between us and the whole idea of there even being in us against them. And I'm building an army. And I want you on my side. Will you join me? And they said, hell yeah. And we had some coffee. And you know what? We had a great long talk as long as I could stay awake. And then I went back home. And um, every single interaction with law enforcement from that point on was increasingly better and better and better and better. And eventually I got to the point where because of Abdullah and inspiring me to do this, I was able to have healthy police interactions while exercising my rights. And it wasn't an either or. That's awesome. You you just now inspired me. I don't think I've ever confronted my boogeyman. I'm usually like a mediator trying to solve or connect people when they're having disputes online, but never confronted my boogeyman. So I think I think everyone that's listening, that should be the challenge again this week. I I, I think you challenged everyone last week on that one, correct? I think we should do it again, but I think you explained it very well on how we should do it. So any yeah, last yeah. thoughts? So, so that's what we got to do so that we're able to work together so yeah. that we're able to solve our problems ourselves, because who is the best person to solve our problems, Angelette? Me. <laughs> you. Me. Me. We are. It's the people who are closest to the problems yeah. and the creativity that comes out of 
the people who are not only close to the problems, but have the niche knowledge about the issues and the community and the very unique constellation of factors affecting that situation is always the person who can come up with the most sustainable solution, the most effective solution, and the most moral approach to that solution as well. So we have to be able to work together and we have to be able to talk to each other, especially during this time. Yeah, I think we should listen more than we talk though sometimes. I mean, we were given two ears and one mouth for a reason, so. That's right, well, so give me something to listen to. Exactly, um, and, and I think you mentioned that with your story with Ab Abdullah, is his name? Abdullah. Abdullah, that you got an opportunity to hear him and where he came from. You, you didn't know that you were the first American that he's ever met or that his you know, family you know, was dead if you didn't have that opportunity to listen to him and see where he was coming from. Right. That's right. So, so let's all out, go out there and be the solution and um, confront your boogeyman. All righty. Okay. Tune in next time for Be the Solution Part. <laughs>